really important in bringing forward some of the issues that we've been talking about in this group. But there are a couple of other things that we're still working on for this project. One is to build out our website a little bit more. Um, and that involves in part creating more lesson plans, um, in part creating other materials. And then the other thing is a book that we have been thinking about editing that's going to draw on some of the things that we've learned. Um, but I'm wondering from other people if there's anything you'd like us to do to create more ways to teach this stuff in the classroom. Or if there's any particular lesson you've learned from the last two days or the last three years about how we should do this. And um, I thought the resources that you, um, you know, developed uh, and, um, you know, mentioned throughout the symposium, if there's a way for us to access, uh, you know, like, if there's like a, like a, a table or, you know, directory that we could that enables us to tap to those sources and also to the sources um, that uh, the presenters had mentioned. There were so many that I didn't, I, I, I had a hard time tracking a lot of those. Resources. So I just put the website of our, or the link to our website in the chat. Um, but Kyung Hee was recording all of the chats for this uh, symposium. And I think that every single website that was mentioned, we're going to put up on our website as a link because we've got a, a resources section there. Um, and some of them are amazing. I especially thought that, that the websites that Kim and Jonathan have created are so beautiful and so useful and so interesting um, that I hope that lots of people will will use them in the classroom. Absolutely. Um, how do we get out word about these resources that we've collected? Well, I'll, I'll jump in here, Dave. <laughs> sure, Patrice. Since my department's been so well represented here, <laughs> thank you for highlighting TDM. We are so proud of being part of all of this. Um, I really think that faculty development is the way to reach it. We had some, we had so many students here, but we really didn't see many faculty. And as I was checking, most of the time I had speakers without video off, but I kept checking to see it was here. And, um, am I wrong, but I didn't see a lot of art and design faculty here. I saw more business, liberal arts, you know, our faculty. Um, I think. As somebody who teaches across all boards, who has also taught in the A and D school, who is a graduate of the graduate program, I think that there's so many different angles that have been touched on here. There is the racial sensitivity issue. I was so happy to see the Asian element this afternoon in the cultural appropriation, because um, that's so important in the fashion. What everybody uses the the Chinese Cheng Sam and the and the sari as a fashion starting point. Why? Where where is the difference between when that's appropriation and when's invitation? Um, the the racial part. The two websites you mentioned were just phenomenal, but they were also built on what Justine has done with the fashion history website at FIT, which wasn't mentioned. So I think within our school, and I, I loved the combination with, um, there were so many people from Parsons here, because many of us have taught at Parsons too. We have good colleagues at Parsons in the new school. I would love to encourage more inter-school inter collaboration within New York. I was thrilled to hear um, the people from Chicago. Uh, that gave us a new perspective. Like we sort of think that all of our design education is on the East Coast. Did we have anybody from California here? I mean, no. that, that's because that's so agricultural and that's a big cotton growing. So I think um, the possibilities of just expanding it globally, uh, I'm not globally, in, in, intercontinentally, you know, within the United States, within, um, there was no, uh, that would have been great to have representation from South America or Brazil. So it's just the expansion. I think it, there was so many important things brought up here that, Either through Fulbright, some of us are, are Fulbright people, and we could expand through that network. We could expand through other associations we belong to. But I think this is not just important for the institutions that were here, but for all of us in higher education who teach textiles and fashion. 
um, maybe a database of who teaches textiles and fashion and, and just a list of what courses we teach. I, I learned about three courses in textile history that I didn't know existed at FIT and I teach textile history. <laughs> so each department, we're siloed in our own department. So um, that would be a really interesting comparison to start with who teaches what and what kind of curriculum do we teach and what do we cover in those courses, starting with at FIT and then moving on our circles further out. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be useful for Kim, he and I to like do a tour of art and design departments, like ask to come to department meetings and just tell them a little bit more about what we've been doing so that we can make more people aware? That could be helpful or uh, I'm going to call in Greta here. Um, that's also perhaps something that the, the uh, embedded librarians might want mm -hmm. to get involved. What do you think, Greta? Is she still there? Yeah, but that that could be something. Um, I know we use the library as as a resource. The writing studio, also. Sorry, the writing uh, studio is super valuable resource for our students, and that's a, a lot of my students get ideas from the writing studio too. I think it might be nice to actually, if the lia if the liaison could accompany either Dan or Kyung Hee. Um, I do think when you go to different meetings, people hear things in a different way. I do know it's hard to get on the agenda, but if you, if really when the school year starts is the best time before, you know, where everything's fresh and there aren't all the reappointment and tenure and et cetera. But when the, I, I feel like if a, a library person were with you, then we would, um, be able to talk about our resources and also um, it's always informative to hear the responses from the faculty and what they is visible to them and what is not visible to them. So I, I think um, that that partnership would be nice and then we could sort of propel the information through our various mechanisms like making resource guides and things like that. So. Greta, is this something that should happen this fall? Because I'm worried that this fall will be unusual and people will feel stressed out and not need another thing to look at. No. And does that mean then we wait another year before we start really presenting this stuff? Mm -hmm. It's so hard to say um, what, it, what it's going to look like. It actually, um, you know, we're anticipating Remote, but how are those meetings like the, how are the department meetings going to work in a hybrid yeah. situation? Um, yeah. so it's a big question, but in fact, you know, being remote makes it easier for everybody to attend a meeting. So, um, I don't know. <laughs> no, but, that's a good point. Uh, and it's easy to share screen and show them materials. Um, yeah, exactly. So maybe maybe departments will just decide, even if they're in their office, to have a remote meeting so they can catch all their faculty, in which case it would just be like sending an invite so we could find, you know, and figuring out which librarian could attend. So I don't think it's, I mean, people are obviously sick of talking about the, um, the, uh, Pandemic, so I, I, I mean, so I we'll give them that, something new to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it might be nice to, you know, have other topics on the agenda. But on the other hand, like, who knows whether that's realistic or not? It's anyone's guess. Yeah, but I think also that the students. I mean, having now taught students the same students for three semesters, <laughs> because my 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 woven production class goes over two semesters. So um, I've had the students for two semesters who have never even been to FIT. And one of their primary concerns is how am I going to work? Where am I going to work? What, especially on the labor side, what are my opportunities? So, um, and a lot of them are not in the country. I have three in India, I have four in Turkey, I have two in Brazil. I mean, ha uh, uh, actually 25% of my TDM students are not even in the country and they would, be so happy to hear this and, and the course I teach in trade and technology that only goes to freshman AAS students. So my, my bachelor students don't get it, but they are taking art history classes. They are taking liberal arts classes. So I would love to know that um, my colleagues in liberal arts and, and other classes were bringing up the same issues or at least bringing up the conversations. And I think we talked about that yesterday about conversations versus debate. 
you know, teaching kids, and that was a great discussion we had earlier today. I can't remember which panel it was in. I think it was on the racism, but how to in a class. I love the module idea. I love the idea of having an open conversation with no assessments. Because I think especially the kids who are sitting on their beds from another country or another state, they're feeling so isolated and their opinions are being formed by social media and maybe their parents and their friends and their, their locality. Um, yeah, so I think those those combinations of, of of global awareness and also what how the job market is changing so much right now. They're not going to go back to traditional jobs. My kids are never going to work in a mill again. The mills are gone. You know, we 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 still train people to work in a mill, but there are no mills here unless they moved to India. And actually, some of my students own their own mills. That's another story. <laughs> um, but. Like I have one student, it's like, oh, can you go out and buy a loom? I don't have to. My dad owns 45 of them. It's like, okay. <laughs> That's another perspective. But um, we we have to train them to think and understand if they're going to produce textiles, if they're going to source fiber, how where is that really coming from? You know, it's not coming from Alibaba. It's not coming from you go to Alibaba and then purchase it. No, it's coming from people who are picking it. I didn't know 50% of the world's cotton crop was still um, produced by hand and I've worked with Jeff for 40 years. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. amazing. Yeah, um, I think that 1 thing that grows out of what you just said, Patrice, is this thing we've been struggling with for years, which is where does this go in the curriculum? And yeah. I think that we need to do more conversations, especially between liberal arts and A and D, but also maybe B and T faculty to see what everybody's doing. So that we can let each other know, as you say, you know, maybe we've got complementary lessons going on. Um, is that, should this be in sociology? Isn't this like a like a very much related to uh, what FIT is all yeah. about? You know, art and design students and history of labor and design sounds like. I feel like it should, should be obvious <laughs> choice. In, um, you know, in history class. Well, you know, you're not required to take a history class anymore. So Carl, who was the chair of the last panel, created a class which has been incredibly popular, uh, nice. which is American history from the perspective of fashion and textiles. Um, and he raises a lot of these issues, but he only gets as many students as want to take this. It used to be that U.S. history was required for everybody. It's not anymore. Um, and so all of the enrollments in the areas that I think you would suggest, except for art history, which also is doing a lot of this, but sociology, history, political science are all in pretty steep decline in terms of enrollment. And so one of the reasons why we wanted to create these short lesson plans was to give them to other departments to teach them because the students aren't taking our classes anymore. Um, yeah. Or maybe it just has to happen in art history. Um, My department, uh, for the past uh, three to five years, we created a lot of other world civilization courses or existing courses. The um, what is student learning outcome or um, the course of the study doesn't change because it was written 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But mm -hmm. we um, updated a lot of readings uh, or structure of the course so that. Um, individual faculty members uh, address those issues. And you heard Natalie Nudel talking about it, um, you know, how to teach history of textiles in her class, for example, in, in um, uh, yesterday. Uh, or uh, Andrew Weinstein teaches history of industrial design, and that is only offered in one section these days. It's not required for art and design students. In some schools, like a Pratt Institute or Parsons, that history of industrial design is sort of a required for any design major, but here right. it is not. Students just choose it if the schedule fits them. But like a modern art, we have uh, how many sections? Six uh, sections of the same class, but history of industrial design, I mean, you think it's, uh, it's required, right? Like it should be uh, an essential class, but we only, uh, uh, you know, like Andrew Weinstein only teaches one section of it. Um, so here are some you know, strange structural problems and also students too. They are aware of those, but they cannot choose those interesting classes because of the conflict of schedule. 
Um, mm. Some of my students come back and they say, I plan <coughs> to take this history of East Asian costume for three years because it is offered always Wednesday morning. And uh, if it coincides with their important major, they cannot take it. And also, interesting enough, I teach a lot of uh, art and design students, especially illustration majors. I feel like I know illustration department so well, <laughs> and I should be part of illustration department. Japanese art, Asian art, you name it, a lot of illustration students are coming. Uh, but on the other hand, I never had many uh, AMC, for example, hardly any AMC students because in and art I and only get AMC and I get no art and design students these days. And exactly. all of that like, has changed. Mm -hmm. Before the gen ed requirements got opened up, I got tons of everybody. And I think art, uh, art history got tons of everybody back then also. And they sort of loose. I think what happened is one, they loosened up the gen ed requirements, and two, they introduced the minors, which in a lot of ways are great. But it means that if you only have a certain number of electives and you want to take a minor, you're going to cluster all of your electives in a certain area. Um, and for B and T people, that's going to be economics. For A and D people, that's going to be art history. Um, and enrollments in other areas are going down. So I think if we want this stuff to be taught, we can't necessarily say, well, let's do it in sociology and history. We got to find ways to get it into the curricula of the classes that students are taking. Well, how how about the minors? The, the minors are being revamped now, right? Because um, I know there's a committee. I don't think I, I don't think I'm on it. <laughs> I can't keep track. But I know that the minors are going to review because Nomi and I, um, between TSD and, and TDM, we, we've been proposing a textile minor, which could include courses like these, you know, liberal <coughs> courses. Um, but about five years ago, we put together all of the textile related courses that were at FIT and we were looking at art history, but they've all changed. I mean, since then, in that time we've done that, they've all been changed or moved or um, revamped or dropped or whatever. So we went, we were planning to revisit that, but we were waiting for the committee to sort of decide what, what they're doing with minors right now. Well, like, you know, the bigger issue is in A and D, um, some of those retired professors are not replaced. So you end up right. having a lot of part-timers. Because mm -hmm. of that, there is always a schedule changes. And right. then now academic affairs enforce that 15 minimum, you know, students. And right. that fundamentally changed the A and D, um, course assignment, you know, like a fashion design, for example, you have AOP list and constantly people are bumped and my students then come back and say, I really want to take your Japanese art history again Wednesday morning, right? They planned since freshman year, they cannot take it because suddenly their major class, right, from nine to one or something changed to, it was canceled because it's not 15, right? Like a, whatever the number is, they only had 11, then it's canceled. And you don't have a many full time faculty members, then, you know, part time instructors are bumping each other, right? All those things so that students ended up losing all those uh, interesting elective courses. Um, so it's a bigger structural issue, you know, FIT losing full time faculty members and not replacing them uh, is part of a larger story. Right. Same and thing for our, you know, our 15, um, 15 students' requirements for liberal arts classes. Like a, there are so many interesting classes these days because we, we, you know, liberal arts hired many new faculty members for the last six, seven years. Uh, but that the, the magic number of 15 is very hard to, to get there. You have a 12. 12 is a good enough number, right? Especially to have an interesting discussion and so forth. Maybe you will get up to 16. You wait, right? And then people will come back. But it's canceled, right? Then there is a whole series of going down, you know, to another right. place. Right. Another thing that those of you who aren't in B and T may not be aware of is that um, two years ago B and T was accredited as a mm -hmm. business school. So we had to drop courses and alter courses and drop hours of existing courses to fit in a few extra business courses so that all B and T. I think there might be one or two departments that didn't sign on. But FBM, TDM, almost everybody in B&T now graduates with a degree that is accredited by a business school. So that would be an opportunity to, <laughs> to add it, to try to fit into those courses, especially the labor history part, mm -hmm. to, to, to see what courses are there and who's teaching them and to see what we can do in that area too. 
but art and design students won't be taking those classes. And one of the things that really struck me also about this is, is that everybody in AMD should be taking B and T classes. Everybody in B and T should be taking AMD classes. Exactly. And these sort of requirements that you're talking about make it very, very difficult to do that because you're required to take so many business classes to maintain that accreditation. Um, but I kind of feel like, you know, how can you have a degree from FIT and not know how to sew? Even if you were an AMC major or a toy design major or whatever, I think everybody should learn to sew at FIT because we have that ability to teach everybody. Yeah. Um, and everybody should know about finance a little bit and whatever else. Um, but I don't think any of those things are going to change anytime soon. Oh, no, it's getting worse because of the course that our department has been a service agency for the introduction to textiles, which is a four credit mm -hmm. class, a four up four face hour class. Um, that's being combined with introduction to marketing as one four credit class. So yeah. basically all of our adjuncts are now will probably never get CCE'd because they will never earn, they'll have to be here 35 years to get enough credits mm -hmm. by teaching only half a semester. Instead of teaching four hours a week, they're teaching two hours a week. And that's the fundamentals of textiles, which has been the base of us, and the fundamentals of marketing. The two things you would think a business degree would be built on are, are being um, you know, cut in half from, from FBM so that they can um, increase their you know, core courses, most of which are like computer, big data, big science, you know, uh, PLM kinds of very technical courses. The FBM is a very, very technical course now, where it used to be much more shopping, marketing, sourcing. Mm -hmm. So um, that not that it's necessarily bad, and maybe what's going on with, with the future, but in terms of structure and where you can fit a class and where you can fit something into curriculum, it's, it's a huge, huge shift in what we can offer. And also, you probably heard about Gen Ed requirements being uh, being revised. Uh, we got the request from SUNY system, and uh, currently, liberal arts departments are reviewing it, and that is also pretty rigid. It's like a Gen Ed requirement for AAS, AAS degree is a minimum 20 credits. So currently, 24 credits uh, listed for wow. FIT. And that is what uh, three so eight classes uh, of liberal arts and various gen ed uh, and SUNY came up with a slightly different composition. So instead of nine gen ed area, now there are eight areas. <laughs> but then they also wow. made six six competencies, uh, six areas of competency, um, and which is really confusing. <laughs> you you have eight yeah, areas. The new you system. Have and and when I see the competencies, uh, almost uh, any class can uh, meet all you know at least four or five competency skills. And what does that mean? I mean, it it, it is actually not a better system; it's it's a worse. Uh, so anyhow, we we you know we are uh, reviewing it, and we are going to send it back. It's not set in stone yet. That's why you know SUNY is discussing it with um, other colleges within the system. Um, so um, it is it is a tough moment, and that's why you know we are doing this humanities projects. Um, and but you, you are very wanna, important. Yeah, I want to respond to seriously to Leslie's text about uh, how to how that how to cook. Um, yes. I think I think every FIT student should learn how to cook. I'm really upset that there is no uh, test kitchen classrooms in the new building. Uh, that's mm -hmm. like the one thing I would have liked to have seen in the new building. Isabella Bertoletti has been trying to get a food minor, uh, and they keep rejecting her, but hopefully, you know, that'll change. And I thought, just think there's such an opportunity sort of within the photography department to create a food styling program. Um, oh my God, so yes. many different, different ways that incorporating food into our current majors could be really interesting. But we also have a packaging design. Remember, like, a what, you know, what yeah. kind of packaging thing? Oh, in? it's all about food. Oh, my God. But Mike Kokinas, didn't he have a grant? Who had, it was Mike, right, who had a grant a few yeah. years ago. They had a, was it a, fa what was their grant? Family recipes or something? There was a whole series of. They did of that. They did come eat some insects. Yeah. Um, they did oh, that was not so <laughs> <laughs> but I remember there was there was an Indian food day in the Great Hall where like yeah. there was, we've had them in the past, but they're not courses. But there's certainly ways to get people engaged and interested, like like um, 
I was just in Youngstown, Ohio, where my family's from, and they were talking about cookie tables. I go, wait, that, that's we, we do that at FIT. We have cookie tables for orientation, Youngstown, Ohio cookie tables, you know, so cultural food differences, even between Ohio and Pennsylvania, you know. And then that is continued. Yes. We you definitely know, like a, need a Korean a Turkish the, uh, food festival. Yeah. Definitely need a Turkish food festival. Definitely a Korean food festival. Matthew, Matthew Petunia, right? In yeah. liberal arts. Yeah. She, yeah. He always hosted a cookie table for liberal arts minors. And you know, people really liked it, but um no more cookies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not not for a while, not until we can safely share food again. But we could have online cooking classes. That's true. <laughs> Anyhow, that's, you know, I, I want to say that that's why, you know, Sue or uh, Patrice, Leslie, or any other faculty members who came to, um, you know, uh, symposiums yesterday and today are very important because you already heard all these presentations and, you know, you already got inspired to do a little bit of, uh, you know, like uh, this type of introduction of a business and labor history side whenever you teach your subject area. So. I think we're all redoing our curriculum. It seems that there is opportunity for um, classes to cater to this new um, need for, you know, like a really good, uh, you know, foundational understanding of diversity and equity. So I think DEI is going to be something that is going to be emphasized in my department. If a course could be um, designed to address, you know, comprehensive need for that, because you're right. Uh, uh, we're trying to make our curriculum leaner so that we have more opportunity for students to take business classes and uh, history classes. And if there's a way to sort of say, uh, like a good course for fashion design students, you know, would be um, like combining the labor and diversity issues, like ownership of labor and design, uh, the ownership of labor, culture, and ideas. So if that's a, that is sort of like, way to for students to understand uh again like no, knowing about uh, who makes cotton versus who makes the textile and how you know industrial revolution was fueled by the textile industry all those things are quite important and if there's a way to infuse how cultural appropriation um is is part of that that dialogue like and if you respect the makers, then you owe, or I think there, that leads to respect for, for, um, for who makes it and how, how they use the cultural symbols. So, uh, if there's a more comprehensive class like that, and that, that caters to the need for, for design students, I think that would be really, really good. Because I think right now, the, some of the courses, like, I think, um, is it, you know, there are classes about cultural appropriation, but it's very, very like, like, you know, like very specific, uh, uh, where it's about cultural appropriation and the law. Yeah. yeah. But I, I feel like, Kyunghee, you know, you're creating classes that do a lot, a little bit, um, and we can create more classes like that. Um, how we get people to take them. How we fit them into the curriculum. That's and yeah, so when we do our curriculum, they could be uh, major related, related mm. major mm. classes, meaning mm. it, it has to sort of have that fashion design emphasis. And obviously, mm -hmm. um, if I mean, because that will that that could be categorized as that. Does that make sense? Rather than this random yeah. world of like elective. If it's a, like a related yeah. elective, that yeah, in, in, a, in relation to that a conversation, like a good model is a history of menswear in our department. History of menswear is written for uh, fashion design menswear majors. So uh, we get all of their students. I think they take it in the third year or something. Uh, I don't really remember. It's you know written for them. Or another case, we also have that. Not Natalie teaches it. It's a history of Western textiles, and that's also um, uh, required by uh, textile and search design program. Uh, but we don't have the relationship with the business and technology department because, uh, to begin with, they don't have that type of uh, art history required for their uh, major or their their degree. Um, art and design, they are now part of NASA. You heard a lot about like NASA, the National Association of the School of Art and Design. So they require mm -hmm. at least 
nine credits of art history. Like that's also specifically art history, not not just the general uh, education. So that's why we end up having a lot of A and D students. So. Uh, you know, it's a higher education, you know, structure the system and more, more and more bureaucracy. Um, so um, this is what we can do. At least, you know, we had some uh, small group discussions and, you know, awakening moments uh, among ourselves. Uh, and then some students benefit from those. But like uh, Joey Mao uh, left very interesting uh, comments here. Like she participated a lot, like she's a, uh, what is it? Um, I think she's a graduate student, right? Um, yeah, she's Mei Chen's graduate student. Right, and oh. then um, she also recommended a book. I mean, we are working on a book. <laughs> oh. I, I have to finish my introduction in order to send it to the publisher. <laughs> soon, mm. soon. We finished this. Now it's time mm. to move on to another project. Mm. Um, well, the way I'm thinking just a quick one here is to, you know, I know Elizabeth, who is amazing. Elizabeth Way is just mm -hmm. such a huge part of the museum. But another way to reach people without curriculum is to partner more with the museum because huh. um, at, in, in my TS 111 classes, my intro to textiles, I always like check out to see what the museum shows are and I make people go over and observe things in the museum. And most of them have never walked across the street and gone into the museum and the museum has incredible not just the exhibits, but the um, extracurricular talks and symposiums. And they have a they have a symposium every year on their main thing. They have extra talks. Um, so it just keeping your students aware of what is available at FIT, even if it's not in your class, just to mm -hmm. make them require that the students go to the museum or go to the library, report on something that's happening or, or visit a club that's doing a special event that's not part of yours. I mean, that that can be easily added to so many classes without I just may say write a report about something else that's going on on at FIT that's related to this class. Oh, that's and nice. I like that. I, I do that all the time and they usually love it. I, I didn't even know we had a museum. It's like it's only one third of the other side of the street. Right? I didn't know we had a library. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and the librarians, yeah. thanks to Greta. I mean, when I do finally get a kid to go into the library, they are amazed at how much help you just walk up to the desk the librarians will walk around spend an hour with you buy your lunch call your mother i mean they're so good i i i truly love my library and that that's i think what i've been telling my kids recently is that's one of the biggest things they're missing right now is the experience of like somebody was talking about walking in somebody from parsons i can't remember who about going in and looking at the old vogues for cultural appropriation and for racist mm -hmm. issues we did that all the time, you know, we have that stuff. So just, just encourage people to use the library, encourage people to use the museum. And um, those, it, the issues that we've talked about right now are there, resources are there. Yeah. Our library databases, I mean, they're so underused and we have so much valuable information there yeah. online, you know, the Bloomsbury, uh, the, the WGN, the Vogue history, New York Times history, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. So you don't actually, but I love the, the modules. I love the modules. And I think maybe starting with, with a, a, a survey of faculty to find out what they use now and what they could use and what topics they're interested in. And then we could form a, a committee to develop modules for different departments that might actually be used. Could be. I mean, it can be a conversation, but uh, we also have a freedom to teach whatever we find important, you know, like we have a autonomy yeah. of our own teaching resources and right. some faculty members are <laughs> pretty guarded <laughs> by, by those ideas. Um, so um, we should be a little bit um, diplomatic. Um, I mean, that's why I think, you know, then like uh, at, at, as a dissemination plan after the project is over, uh, we can collaborate with the CET at least once a year to to showcase what has been added or what's available because the materials are written for uh, professors from all different schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is the most valuable option. Uh, sometimes we go to uh, Office of Online Learning and, and introduce those digital humanities resources. Um, so the project will be over uh, end of June of this year, uh, the three year grant, but uh, we need a little bit of implementation plan and that can be a plan. Like Elaine is always open to uh, ideas and CET is a very good uh, venue to reach um, a large amount of faculty members. 
Especially adjuncts. I mean, the adjuncts. Especially adjuncts. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah. you know, I was about to go to adjunct institute that always uh, you know takes place uh, over the summer break, uh, but uh, that was also reduced due to um, pandemic uh, last June. So I don't know what Elaine is planning this summer. Right. Anyhow, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, I think we've run out of things to talk about. Yeah, um, tired too. Actually, let me. Can ten, I ask one hours. more thing? Mm. Can I ask one more thing? And this is mostly to the students. Patrice keeps saying that she thought that my lesson plan went well. I thought it was terrible. How do really? I make it better? No. Nothing for students. Nobody's <laughs> willing to criticize the professor to his face. Why did Why did you feel that way? Like, do you, I just felt yeah. like it didn't. The way I framed it didn't engage. I found it engaging because actually I was really. Very surprised from a lot uh, by what a lot of the students said, and um, I felt like I. I learned from hearing their responses. Um, so I, I, it wasn't my feeling on your session. Okay. I have a question about that, Dan. Was that in a live class or in a virtual class? Uh, you mean when you did that module? When you did when that? When I did it originally the last yeah. time? Yeah, yeah, it was in a virtual class as well. Okay, because I find um, in a live class, they're a lot more intimidated, but in a, in a virtual class, I've had discussions with students that I would have never had oh, that's interesting. in a live class. So I think that that's a, that's a difference too. When they actually see everybody staring at them, they, they're they comfortable with, but when they are only looking at themselves on the screen, hmm. they, they, they say many more open things. So, so we should tell everybody in class when we get back to class to close their eyes before they make class comments. <laughs> yeah, bring back the bandana put over your <laughs> you can ask over your eyes and don't Instead go looking over your mouth. and just have an open conversation. Yeah. Right. But I think I, I want to point out. Oh, oh, your your um the way you did the engagement, the framing of the discussion was really, really interesting. Okay. But I don't know whether for students the the issue of, of the painting and all that. I don't know whether it, there's there's a way to connect to more like you know. Use the example at like the fashion show, whether the students found that to be problematic and what, what the reactionary of the audience, what should they have known? Like, where, where did all those, you know, like, I mean, the fact that in some ways, it seems like from that incident, the students knew why it was wrong, whereas yeah. people in power or people who produced it obviously were like, you know, were were disconnected. What I'm saying is that maybe there's a more of a more of a, a t the issue, similar issue that's related to the students. Whether I don't know whether you're getting the fashion design students. If so, that might be more. There's so many examples of of that that kind of mishap, you know, misunderstanding. Absolutely. Or... And frankly, we originally wanted to do a panel about the MFA show, and there's just too much litigation going on around it. Um, we would have made a lot of people angry if we'd done a panel about that. <laughs> so, um, but, but then I wanted, not, to, yeah, I yeah. wanted to tell you one thing about your lesson plan is, you know, New York City place like FIT or um, CUNY, we have an ethnically diverse classroom versus this type of lesson plan. If you have a, let's say, Arkansas or Alabama's, uh, you know, classrooms are pretty homogeneous. Uh, that can be a very different dynamics. Uh, I, you know, this weekend I am going to Asian American Association Studies Association Conference, and they talk a lot about um, like a homogeneous classrooms, you know, composed of those like a local people who live there for five generations, um, and then they are introducing those ideas of South Asians, you know, transnational workers. But in New York City. Um, like my uh, my experience of teaching students is uh, they are very receptive of those uh, um, conflicts or tensions, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, so I think your lesson plan uh, went well. And as Molly said, images are carefully chosen. 
Um, yeah, Molly so did a great job. That is important too. Um, you, know, you, you didn't show that Anna, Anna should work right there, <laughs> like a newspaper. You know, it's, a, it's more like a, a activist uh, culture, and uh, it was it was sensitive, right? And go I take out the check out the pictures that she uh, did for the uh, the other the Dorothy Lang lesson plans. She ah, did a Dorothy really great Lange, job. Open, yeah. Um, I, I was really impressed with your students because you were you were asking some serious stuff and they really, really were well informed and 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 like really receptive to, you know, being sensitive and all in doing things the right way. So I thought that was really I mean, I felt like that was really good way to to engage students seriously. And most of you are still here. So thank you, Shin. Thank you, Imani. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Paige. I really appreciate yeah. all of your participation. India, thank you for the comment that you just put in. Greta, I see your comment also. And part of me wanted to like push the other end because I think in a full class of students, there would have been some students who said, I don't see anything wrong with Dana Schutz doing this painting, or at least they would have thought it. And I hope that I would have been able to make them feel safe enough to say it. Yeah. Um, yeah, the other student yeah, I want to um, say something about is Jamaica, who mm -hmm. sat there alone as a student on that panel, and she did an amazing job. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah, we knew she'd yeah, be able so to handle that. All the students who spoke were just phenomenal, just like, just just what we expect from an FIT student. <laughs> yeah, just to let you know, Paige and then uh, Shamika, they are all AMP students, and some of them are going to art history Symposium this weekend held at SUNY New Parts. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, we have a spectacular students um, yeah. in our curriculum of particularly our history and museum professions. You know, the, the curriculum, they actually learn a lot about this business and labor history, uh, just yeah. like Natasha Deegan's program of art market studies. Um, it, it's very specialized for those issues of mm -hmm. labor, capital, right? symbolic capital, um, and then um, the you know, social class, I mean, contemporary art sales are we really for like a top 0.5 percent of people. Yeah. <laughs> Some galleries were selling a lot of works over the pandemic because people are spending time at home versus right. Like uh, most of my friends, artists are struggling, you know, just to pay for mortgage or sending kids to college. And, you know, so uh, it's true. It's, uh, yeah, income gaps. But anyhow, a student. I think someone so else much. was going to say something. Greta. Oh well, uh, no, but I, I I would like to say, Kungi and Dan, that you should uh, pat yourselves on the back. Like this, like tremendous amount of work, and it went really smoothly, and everything was so interesting. And so I just thank you. You know, want to express my appreciation for all and that you've India done. India and Robin deserve a lot of the praise as well. Thank you guys so much. Great choice of panelists, the, the different schools. How did you get Harvard and Princeton in here? I mean, that was great. <laughs> so Kenohi, I actually went to grad school with, so that wasn't so hard. Um, and Sven, I just emailed I him and he said yes. Well, that was great because I think everybody who teaches history uses Sven's books. So. <laughs> yeah. We were responsible for a lot of Amazon Kindle sales on that. <laughs> you, you guys are really All right, I think we're done. Thank yes. you for including me in this venture. No, but Sue, thank, thank you so you much for, for working us. hard. You know, all of our chairs, they found the speakers too, you know. So uh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thanks everybody. Thank